Hello, I am Dr. Azal from MedicoVisual.com and in today's visual lecture, we will talk about development of diaphragm. So, what is diaphragm? So, basically, diaphragm is a musculotendinous dome-shaped structure. What it is? It is a musculotendinous dome-shaped structure. What I mean by this is that, that it consists of muscular part as well as the tendinous part i mean it consists of muscle as well as tendon and it is a dome shaped structure uh, in the central area there is the tendon tendinous part called central tendon and at the periphery is the muscular part of this dome shaped structure called diaphragm now you must be aware of this fact that diaphragm is the most important muscle of respiration and uh, it basically separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So here is the thorax and here is the abdominal cavity or you can say peritoneal cavity. So this musculotendinous dome shaped structure which is an important muscle of respiration it separates the thorax from the abdominal cavity now in today's uh, lecture we will not go into its physiology but our focus will be the embryology of diaphragm so we will start discussing the development of diaphragm but before that let me break a good news for you that if you are following these lectures of body cavities up till now you have watched that part one and part two of this series it will be very easy for you to understand the embryology of diaphragm because most of the stuff will be repeated in this lecture so and by the way if you haven't watched those lectures please watch those first because uh, without watching them uh, you won't understand this lecture. So let's start the video. So here are the structures that you have been looking in the uh, from the previous lectures and uh, here the new thing is this neural tube. I have removed this cranial part of this neural tube and rest of the part of neural tube is shown in this diagram in this 3D model and this is the septum transversum. Then here is the par axial mesoderm i hope you can see here somewhat here is the par axial mesoderm then uh, there is it is continuous with the intermediate and lateral plate mesoderm and lateral plate mesoderm by the way one a part of this lateral plate mesoderm it is surrounding the uh, the gi tube which is not shown in this 3d model and the other part is inner lining underlining the uh, body wall which is the somatopleuric mesoderm and one that is surrounding this gi tube it is the saplanchnopleuric intraembryonic saplanchnopleuric mesoderm now if you focus on this par axial mesoderm uh, let me label it for you so here is this par axial mesoderm this is the par axial mesoderm and here you can see basically it's a continuous column like this it's a continuous mesoderm and it goes beyond below that and cranially as well it is continuous cranially like this so basically it's a it's a continuous column but during a uh, third week almost during third week of development what actually happens that this continuous par axial mesoderm this continuous column of par axial mesoderm it is actually uh, divided into a uh, small subunits that are called somites so for example uh, let me draw this continuous column like this so initially it is like this a continuous column uh, like this so yeah initially let's say it's it's like this and i have uh, again shown a part of that column of course it will be continuous uh, cranially as well like this and caudally as well so i hope you got the point now this continuous column it will be actually split into subunits small subunits like this it will be split into small subunits small uh, like this small subunits will be formed from this and this continuous column of paraxial mesoderm it is it gets divided into small uh, smaller subunits called somites and uh, at the cranial part there are also somitomeres which are incomplete divisions but our focus of discussion of today's lecture will not be the somites and somitogenesis 
we already have a complete lecture on somatogenesis. If you want to understand a bit more detail about the somites, please watch that lecture. Now, what happens to these somites is that within these somites, the fate of the cells that are forming the somites is determined. For example, within these somites, some of the cell, they will be destined to form, let's say, muscles. Somewhat here, let's say, they will be, become destined to form muscles. And some of them, they may become destined to form the uh, sclerotome. They will form the sclerotome, which is basically destined to form the skeleton and tendinous part. And some of them, they will, uh, they will convert to those cells that will form the precursor of dermis of the skin. So dermatome, myotome and sclerotome will be formed and let's not go into those details. Now come to this diagram here you can see there is that continuous column of paraxial mesoderm and let's move forward. So I have by the way removed a part of this this cranial part of this uh, mesoderm and then what happens? that here you can see this continuous column of par axial mesoderm is now split into smaller subunit and each subunit is called somite so let's suppose this is uh, the this is one somite this is second somite this is third this is fourth actually let's call it c3 this is the cervical 3 this is cervical 4 this is cervical 5 this is cervical 6 and so on then there is the thoracic thoracic 1 2 3 and so on then there is lumbar and there is, then there is sacral let's not go into those details now what the important thing is that the cervical somites uh, basically specifically the c3 c4 and c5 which are basically in the neck region these cervical somite from these cervical uh, within these cervical somites the myotome of these cervical somites which consist of muscle cell precursors muscle precursor cells they will migrate uh, from this um, and from this somite from their somites they will migrate from here they will move from here and they will through this lateral plate mesoderm they will ultimately go to this septum transversum and here the septum transversum will now be enriched with the muscle forming cells the muscle precursor cells initially the, there was no muscle precursor cells within the septum transversum but now it will become enriched with the muscle forming cells so let's see the animation that how this process actually happens that how the cells migrate from this from their somite from their respective somites Now here you can see that I have changed the color. Initially the septum transversum was totally white but now because it has become enriched with muscle forming cells, uh, let's say its color is changed. Another thing that you might have noticed that along with these somites, a nerve also entered uh, from the cervical region, a nerve also entered in the septum transversum. Now actually this diagram is slightly wrong in my opinion and that's my own mistake. I created this diagram, this 3D model myself. Actually there should be from this C3 region of, this, uh, of the spinal cord, there should be one element, then there should be another root from C4 and then there should be C3, C4 and C5. So all these three uh, roots, they will combine to form what we call as phrenic nerve. And this phrenic nerve, uh, this phrenic nerve is going to supply the diaphragm. And uh, from the previous lecture, you must be remembering that the phrenic nerve, it passes through the pleuropericardial fold and pleuropericardial fold is the precursor of uh, fibrous pericardium. And that is the reason why the phrenic nerve in adults, you, you must have seen if you have done the dissection, that phrenic nerve passes through the fibrous pericardium of the heart and ultimately it reaches the diaphragm and it supplies the diaphragm it supplies the motor motor part of diaphragm and sensory part as well most of the sensory part as well so c3 c4 and c5 now the important thing here is that because the somites that contributed to the myoblast muscle precursor cells of the diaphragm they were from the somite c3 c4 c5 
and in the similar fashion the neuromers these are basically called neuro neuromers let's not go into detail of neuromers uh, in simple terms you can understand that these are the subunits of uh, of the spinal cord that supply a particular section of a particular area of the embryo or particular section of the embryo so uh, the neuromers they also originated from here and because this is c3 c4 and c5 uh, c5 uh, somites the nerve root that followed through these somites it is also c3 c4 and c5 by the way there is a mnemonic to remember the phrenic nerve nerve root of phrenic nerve that is c3 c4 c5 keeps you alive c3 c4 c5 keeps you alive by letting you breathe with the help of diaphragm now the diaphragm it is initially in the cervical region one thing that will happen is that it will descend downward and it will reach up to t12 or l1 level and along with that you must be remembering that the certain folds are formed certain ridges of the of the muscle of the body wall are formed and these are called that separates basically the pleural cavity from the peritoneal cavity and these are named as pleuro peritoneal folds we have uh, seen them in the previous lecture so here are the pleuro peritoneal folds and along with that of course the diaphragm will descend downward and as the diaphragm descend downward it also pulls the phrenic nerve along with it so that is the reason why that actually this uh, this uh, muscular tendinous structure actually it is between the uh, thorax and abdomen it is much uh, at a much lower level but its nerve root is at the cervical region at the neck region the reason is that initially the septum transversum is the is in the neck region but uh, and it got its uh, muscular precursor muscle precursor from the somites of neck region but later on it descended downwards and it pulled its nerve along with it now here you can see that the pleuro peritoneal folds these are the this uh, this sea green colored these are the pleuro peritoneal folds now uh, there is with the formation of this these pleuro peritoneal folds now there is no more a connection between the uh, the thoracic or pleural cavity and uh, there is no connection with the between the pleural cavity or thoracic cavity and between the uh, abdominal cavity or peritoneal cavity now this connection is lost with the formation of pleuro peritoneal folds so in this 3d model although i haven't shown the pleura and the lungs but just imagine that lungs and pleura are of course in this cavity so this they will sort of balloon out they will grow laterally and this lateral body wall it will become sort of extended laterally so like this you can see they are extended laterally and what actually happened here that this rim you can see this rim of lateral body wall here this rim of lateral body wall it is also it has now also become sort of a part of this uh, this interface uh, this uh, thoracic abdominal interface i should say it has become the part of this thoracic abdominal interface and now it will also contribute towards the formation of diaphragm here you can see it a little bit more clearly and let me just annotate it for you so here you can see a crescenteric fold is formed like this this is the peripheral rim and this is the contribution from the body wall lateral body wall towards the diaphragm it is it will also become the component of diaphragm so one contribution to diaphragm is this peripheral rim the other contribution is septum transversum then yet another contribution is this pleuro peri, uh, pleuro peritoneal fold and final contribution is this part of uh, mesentery of esophagus or you can say mesentery of foregut so four components are involved in the formation of diaphragm and it is very important uh, question that is often asked in exams now later what happens that uh, this this peripheral rim initially it is slanting like this but later what will happen to it is that it will uh, be pushed slightly downward with uh, the formation of that uh, uh, that growth of that uh, uh, lungs it will be slightly slanting downwards like this 
like this it will become slightly slanting downwards like this and here it will form a sort of gutter called costo costo diaphragmatic diaphragmatic recess so a recess is formed with this downward growth of lungs for example lung will grow here lungs and pleura will uh, protrude downward like this so here this recess is formed called costodiaphragmatic recess so let's watch the animation so things will become more clear for you So here you can see how uh, this it tilted like this and two thing happen two things happened because of this uh, because of this uh, growth downward growth of uh, lungs and pleura one is that of course there is the formation of that costodiaphragmatic recess and the other thing is that it contributed to that particular dome shaped structure of the diaphragm now what actually happens that all these muscle forming cells are lying within this septum transversum they are enjoying their life within the septum transversum but this huge bulky old man this septum transversum it will say i'm not gonna form the muscular part of diaphragm i will sit there and i will provide the sport and strength to you i will provide the wisdom to you to the diaphragm i will become the tendon and i will donate and i will spread and give this this muscle forming cells to all other neighboring structures all other contributors so what this old man will do is that it will uh, it will donate it will distribute the muscle forming cells from itself it will give it to the pleuroperitoneal fold to the uh, to the this peripheral rim which is contributed by the body wall and here also to this and this and it will also contribute these muscle forming cells these muscle precursor cells to this this part of to this part of mesentery of esophagus so all these things they will become the muscular part of the diaphragm and it is it itself the septum transversum specifically the superior part of septum transversum it itself will become the central tendon of the diaphragm it will not form the muscular part it will not contribute to the muscular part of diaphragm so let's watch the animation to understand it more clearly so here you can see that its color is not changing and it has contributed its uh, its muscle precursor cells initially it was enriched with muscle cells muscle forming cells so it donated it distributed all these muscle forming cells to the related structures so now you can see this uh, peripheral rim it has also become muscular this pleuroperitoneal fold it has also become muscular and here you can see within the mesentery of this uh, esophagus leg like struct legs like structures are formed and these are basically called crura of diaphragm so this mcq might be asked in exam that the crura of diaphragm they are formed by which structure so answer would be that these are formed by the mesentery of esophagus and then of course the muscles are donated by the septum transversum but it is actually formed by the mesentery of esophagus then there are this pleuroperitoneal folds and then this is the peripheral rim of uh, the peripheral rim of the body wall that contributed to the muscular part of diaphragm now please keep that in mind that because all these muscle precursor cells they came from the somite c3 c4 c5 and uh, c3 c4 c5 has the same nerve root c3 c4 c5 so all this whole of the muscular part whole of the diaphragm rather i should say the motor part the muscular part of whole of the diaphragm it is uh, provided the muscular nerve supply muscles nerve supply is by the phrenic nerve and sensory supply of most of the diaphragm is also through the phrenic nerve except except this peripheral rim structure because this peripheral rim is contributed by the lateral body wall and uh, that is the reason why its sensory innervation is through the lower six intercostal nerves you must be uh, you must have understood by now that uh, 
initially they, they these were the part of here these were the part of intercostal area so they were initially being supplied by the intercostal nerves so they uh, retained their sensory supply through the intercostal nerves but because the muscular contribution the muscle precursor cells were contributed to this septum transfer from c3 c4 c5 and that is the reason the muscular supply of whole of the diaphragm is through the phrenic nerve but sensory supply of the periphery is through the lower six intercostal nerves but the rest of diaphragm sensory as well as motor supply is through the phrenic nerve so keep that in mind now other thing that you must understand is that this uh, uh, the septum transversum it can be basically divided into two parts uh, so here is the superior part which contributed towards the formation of central tendon of diaphragm and then there is that inferior part and inferior part it has almost no role in the formation of diaphragm basically what happens that this inferior part it contributes towards the formation of uh, the liver and ventral mesentery and some other structures that we have discussed during the formation of gi tube but let's briefly describe i won't go into details but let's let me briefly uh, tell you those details so what happens actually that the liver bud will grow into this so liver bud grow into this and uh, then what will happen that most of this uh, the septum transversum it will be destroyed and uh, some part uh, that was inside uh, this uh, that 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 came inside this liver bud it will contribute to connective tissue and some other parts of the liver as well as gallbladder which i haven't shown here it will contribute to the liver and gallbladder and most of the remaining part of this lower part of septum transversum it will be destroyed and just a bilayered film will remain like this so now you can see that this bilayered film is basically the ventral mesentery and it will form the falciform ligament and some other ligaments a lesser a lesser momentum and all those structures let's not go into that and it is still covering the this liver bud now this liver bud will further grow and it will form a full-fledged liver like this so it formed the liver and uh, uh, this liver but it formed the liver and liver is on the right side now here one thing you must understand that sometimes uh, now i'm gonna talk about a clinical scenario now sometimes what happens that it is relatively a common condition sometimes what happened that the pleuroperitoneal folds they fail to develop properly and if they fail to develop properly this part this posterolateral part of diaphragm this or this posterolateral part of diaphragm there will be a huge gap into it so for example let's say here if this pleuroperitoneal fold it fails to form properly there will be that huge gap there will be a huge opening there will be a huge hole between the thoracic and abdominal cavity and the contents of abdomen they may protrude and they may come into the thoracic cavity through this hole and this condition is called congenital diaphragmatic hernia what it is called it is called congenital congenital diaphragmatic hernia so protrusion of abdominal contents through this hole now this diaphragm hernia it is of different types actually this uh, uh, this opening it may be anywhere there may be some problem here so there may be opening here it may be there it may be some problem here so there might be opening here or here or anywhere it can be anywhere but the most important is on the left posterolateral region somewhat here this is the most common and on the right side it is relatively rare some authors say that it is 10 times 10 times more common on the left posterolateral side as compared to the right side and on the other sides they are even less common now i don't know exactly why that left sided diaphragmatic hernia posterolateral diaphragmatic hernia why it is common but one of the hypotheses is that uh, that on the right side there is that development of that huge liver this humongous structure liver is there on the right side so even if there 
it is the formation of this small hole and uh, there is that weakness of this uh, this pleuroperitoneal fold on the right side if that is the scenario this liver can somewhat compensate for this hernia and it will allow this healing process and it will allow this uh, weak uh, pleuroperitoneal fold to somewhat develop further and it won't allow the protrusion or herniation of abdominal contents significantly into this area so that might be one of the reason i i'm not sure if it's true or not but that might be a reason for the less common occurrence of right-sided posterolateral congenital diaphragmatic hernia as compared to the left side which is much more common let me show you a diagram from cdc website so you will be able to understand it much more clearly so here is the cdc site and here you can see that here is the the, uh, the this diaphragmatic hernia and of course you can see on the right side there is this liver so that might be the reason that it is much more common on the left side posterolateral side and through this opening in the liver the contents of uh, contents of abdomen specifically the loops of intestine they come they herniated into the thoracic cavity but what's the problem with herniation what happens that if there is herniation of this the answer is that uh, if these loops are herniated if the abdominal contents are herniated in the thoracic cavity the lungs are developing the lungs are small at this time if the loops come into the thoracic cavity the 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 lungs won't be able to develop properly so what they say is that the lungs won't mature properly there will be the hypoplasia of lungs there will be hypoplastic lung which may lead to uh, failure to properly breathe after the uh, after the after the baby is born so there may, there may be the respiratory failure which might lead to the death of the baby so it's not the the major issue is not the presence of gut loops in the in the thoracic cavity but actual problem is that there is hypoplasia of lungs secondary to the herniation of abdominal contents into the thoracic cavity and that leads to respiratory failure and that is mainly the cause of death in such cases so that was about congenital hernia and that was about the development of diaphragm the most important thing that you must remember in this lecture is that diaphragm is contributed by four structures and what are the four structures the septum transversum specifically the superior or cranial part of septum transversum which contributes to formation of central tendon then there is the contribution by pleuroperitoneal folds then there is contribution from the mesentery of esophagus and finally there is the contribution from that uh, uh, from that sickle shaped peripheral rim of the body wall lateral body wall so this is the most important take home message from this lecture thank you so much for watching this video